Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the first of our uh, 2021 look ahead presentations. We're gonna do four relatively short videos on different topics uh, uh, looking ahead for 2021. One of them will be looking back to 2020 and uh, we've broken them up into um, four different things so uh, uh, to control the uh, length and be able to address each one in, in some depth. Um, and if uh, you have any questions in the material or like a copy of the slides, please let uh, your team know uh, and they'll be able to answer any questions you might have or transmit the questions uh, to me to ask. So the first thing we're gonna look at here uh, in uh, our series is the uh, election and its impact. Uh, so it'll be a summary going over the results and what happened and what we think uh, the ramifications are. Uh, so just a, a reminder that the things we're going to discuss today are uh, in any any presentation you hear, whether it's with us or Goldman or JP Morgan or whoever, is but we're we're not going to be discussing anything that markets aren't already aware of, and uh, at least to some degree is priced in. So um, if I have anything here, I think is a uh, uh, a huge insight that markets aren't pricing and I'll certainly mention it, but I certainly haven't heard it in any of the many updates and presentations on the election I've listened to. So, um, uh, but just a reminder um, that we don't necessarily want to be, uh, start moving our chips, a lot of our chips based on anything we hear today. So first of all, the general results on the election was um, no clear mandate for either party. It was, uh, uh, a bit of a disappointment on the left relative to what the polling said. Um, uh, the Republicans actually gained in the state houses, which will help them in the post-census redistricting um, uh, going forward. And uh, they, uh, the Democrats lost 10 seats uh, in the House. So uh, there's one seat outstanding, the 22nd district in New York, and depending on how that goes, and it's literally almost a handful of votes right now, and it's going uh, through the courts in New York. Um, the uh, Democratic margin in the House will be either nine uh, or 11 uh, seats. Uh, and in the Senate, uh, the Democrats did, pulled the equivalent of a three-point shot at, uh, at the buzzer to win the game by taking both seats in Georgia, both Senate seats in Georgia in the election last week. And so they have a, a t basically a tie, 50 seats each, with the vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, vice president-elect, being the tiebreaker. Um, and so uh, the Democrats um, ha have control of the, both houses to go with the presidency, but the margin in the House is relatively thin and in the Senate, razor thin. So let's look at that a little bit more. Um, this is a, 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 a plot of Senate members uh, with respect to their voting records, um, how well they track ideologically with their party. And you can see that in both parties, there's a center of uh, moderates. Um, uh, Joe, Joe Manchin is the one from West Virginia who's most frequently mentioned in the news. But in Arizona here, both of our senators, Kelly and Cinema, are considered uh, to be very middle of the road. Um, and uh, there are a total of about 12 senators who will probably not be responsive to uh, legislation from uh, extreme legislation from either side. And if, on the left there in the diagram, we have uh, the new Republican senators and the new Democratic senators, including uh, the two uh, recent ones from Georgia. And so uh, the, the net result of this will probably be that um, a, a large portion of the uh, uh, plat Biden platform will probably pass in the next couple of years, but the very progressive, most progressive elements probably will not pass at this time. Now, this is uh, um, a, a result that's, that's good for the uh, Democratic Party. And my guess is that they will 
um, be in haste uh, to pass their platform uh, because in two years, the House stands, a, a large number of senators stand for re-election, including uh, Warnock from Georgia here, who was just recently elected, and Kelly from Arizona, who are filling seats, uh, will be up again in two years. Um, and on average, each party suffers about a 5% loss in the midterm elections, and a 5% loss in either um, House, uh, the House or the Senate would result in a change of um, leadership to the other party. Um, and so uh, going forward, um, we expect uh, uh, the legislative agenda to come quick and heavy, but not to be too extreme. Um, I have here uh, a compendium of um, the uh, platforms and uh, the red indicates those things that could be changed by executive order. And the rest, I have this uh, for review uh, for the viewers, but in the subsequent parts, I'm just gonna focus on the parts that may more directly affect the economy and, 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 and investments. So we'll be looking at tax issues um, and uh, regulatory issues. So let's uh, diving down on those a little bit. In terms of business taxes, the Biden platform calls for raising corporate taxes to 28% from 21. Now, what will actually happen uh, is probably some, somewhere uh, midway between those two. Um, the deduction for global intangible uh, low tax income uh, is ra uh, cut in half, um, which would be quite a large raise that would fall disproportionately on different sectors, such as the tech sector. Um, and then the uh, uh, another 15% tax to uh, global book income of US-based companies, um, and then uh, reducing some of the real estate tax preferences. And so uh, the, the total intake for those policies, if they were to be implemented in full, is about 1.4 trillion, 300 billion a year over uh, 10 years. So that would be, um, uh, on the business side, a meaningful increase in uh, taxes on the business side. And then on personal taxes, the personal taxes uh, only affect, for the most part, people with in excess of 400,000 of income, which would raise the uh, top marginal rate a couple percent to 39.6. However, taxing capital gains and dividends as ordinary income would be a big increase uh, for some uh, people whose income depends on uh, their investment returns. Um, and then also above 400,000 imposing social security payroll taxes on wages above 400,000. That will probably result in a lot of planning for business owners to cap their wages at 400,000 and, and try to take income in other ways. Um, and then itemized deductions would be further, further limited, um, but Biden is on board with increasing incentives for retirement plan savings and we don't quite know what the details will look like there. So these uh, personal taxes more impact what you keep as investors. The previous corporate income taxes will affect corporate earnings and affect what you get in terms of investment returns from your US investments. And on infrastructure, uh, there's a quite a big plan, 1.7 trillion over four years, which may get front loaded here. Uh, there are rumors in Washington that um, uh, President Biden's going to come out with an aggressive fiscal agenda here now that uh, given the Senate results uh, and the two-year window and that most of this uh, spending is um, uh, fiscal spending will be good for the economy and the stimulative in the short run. And so here's kind of uh, what the spending looked like this summer according to Goldman Sachs. You can see um, how the the gray uh, is in um, tax changes. Oh, to the left is what the full uh, Biden-Harris uh, agenda would be. So the gray in the bottom would be the, the uh, negative effect of tax, corporate and personal tax increases. And on the top are the spending increases, which you can see far outweigh the taxes. On the right is what uh, Goldman Sachs as of midsummer expected to actually get passed. Uh, which may not be too far off the track, but you can see in 2021 20, uh, spending, the spending will probably be more now. 
uh, but it's all front loaded here in the, mostly the first three years and the taxes don't kick in till 2022 and later. So they want, because of COVID, the, the stimulative effects of the spending in the front years uh, is, is what we want. And then the um, more uh, non-stimulative parts of the tax increases come later. Um, but net spending will still be much higher. Uh, so spending first, taxes later. And uh, that has implications for personal planning too. If the tax agenda is implemented, but actually doesn't come into effect till 22 or 2022, um, you know, we have some time perhaps to do some uh, personal income and estate tax planning, as well as in, uh, to look at our investments. Um, the idea here of raising the taxes is that the US has the lowest overall tax burden of any developed country, and that's counting all different kinds, state and local and sales taxes, et cetera. And so there's room to raise taxes. Um, and the rights contention would be, well, taxes are a disincentive to innovation and economic activity. At some point, you get diminishing returns or even reduced economic activity. We really don't know where that point is. Um, uh, but certainly uh, the U.S. is viewed as one of the more innovative uh, countries right now. So, um, but still relative to the rest of the world, um, they're, they're, uh, we are, are not taxed nearly as highly as some of the other uh, countries. Uh, this, uh, ben, uh, taking the previous charts and looking uh, for, at this J.P. Morgan data for the ben, uh, Biden spending agenda, approximately three to four trillion in taxes, eight trillion in spending over 10 years. Um, and so this gives a idea of uh, entitlement expansion, expansion, housing expenses, lots of education, infrastructure, healthcare, drug price uh, reforms. And this doesn't really even include the stimulus that was just passed pre-election uh, uh, pre and then the um, pending stimulus that'll come out will contain some of this, but will contain additional spending for uh, the uh, third uh, COVID wave here. And the taxes on the left, you can see again, are focused on, uh, on the wealthy and corporations uh, and payroll tax, the payroll taxes that the wealthy pay. Um, the fiscal stimulus proposals, the latest I've heard from read about uh, in Washington is that the Biden administration is focusing on going big uh, because of the results in the Senate and the fact that in two years, they may not have control of uh, both branches of the legislature. And so uh, instead of the 750 billion expectation on the chart on the left, which was prepared by uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, the Congressional Budget Office using their data, um, you know, there could, we could be seeing shortly here uh, as much as 2 trillion of aid, which would, uh, in addition to the uh, aid for um, uh, small businesses and, and people uh, suffering economic and employment dislocation from the pandemic would uh, include major new funding for state and local governments. And then also some funding to speed along the vaccine uh, deployment. Um, so another possibility is we may see the infrastructure or more of the infrastructure in this proposal, um, possible green job expansion and uh, expanded healthcare benefits. Um, so it could even go beyond 2 trillion, um, but they are thinking of coming out big. So we will see. Um, and then uh, just as a side note, the corporate tax plans would raise uh, 2.2 trillion of income relative to 740 billion of tax corporate tax cuts provided by over the over uh, President Trump's uh, tenure in office. So there's a quite a big expansion of corporate taxes, but on the personal tax side, uh, the anticipated increases are not recovering uh, the cuts uh, that were enacted during uh, the Trump administration. Um, I'm going to skip over that slide and I want to look at the impact on uh, corporate earnings. Um, uh, the Goldman estimate here is about 12%, which just came out uh, last month. 
Uh, most estimates I've seen are from about 10 to 20 percent um, of, of uh, impact on corporate earnings, which would go right down to the bottom line. Um, and so uh, the consensus is a lot of the moderate legislators are not on board with big corporate increases in corporate income taxes uh, because our corporations do compete with other corporations around the world. Um, and uh, the uh, ultimate version that's passed is expected to be somewhat watered down with a likely earnings of impact of around 6%. So um, as you've probably seen elsewhere and we'll go over in a subsequent uh, presentation, U.S. market valuations are quite extended already, uh, and this would uh, increase the valuations holding everything else constant because it would re reduce the amount of after-tax earnings. Uh, so it would, uh, uh, if prices stay constant, it's, it makes a dollar of corporate earnings even more expensive. On the particular sectors, um, you can see the result of the guilty tax, uh, which would hit uh, uh, services, healthcare, infotech, disproportionately. Um, if you add up both the reduction of the statutory rate from 28 to 21 and the guilty tax um, together, uh, some of the heroes uh, of this year, the tech sector and the healthcare sector would be disproportionately hit um, uh, with uh, the tax increases. But in some of the more um, traditional uh, so-called value sectors, uh, energy, materials, industrials would have a much lower um, uh, burden on, as far as increases on, on taxes. Uh, there would be a new, probably a new antitrust wave, which has begun, begun late in the Trump administration. Um, here are some of the things that uh, we're starting uh, from mid to late last year's uh, activity in that area. Um, but uh, industry consolidation in terms of revenues within sectors now exceeds the last the historical peak, which was last in 1969, which was then focused in the telecom, mostly the telecom uh, industry. Um, and so uh, there's a current su suit uh, from the Department of Justice uh, involving Google with its exclusivity arrangements with its distributors, but this kind of thing is only going to increase, um, which is is you know not necessarily a bad thing, um, but antitrust activity should increase uh, as well as uh, regulatory activity. So um, the net effect, what is what does this mean uh, in the long run? You know, I mostly talked about what's going to happen in the next year or. or or shortly, um, spending. This is a, a chart put out by J.P. Morgan that shows the amount of spending um, uh, under the Biden administration in the blue line, and this goes back to World War II, beginning of World War II around 1940. You can see the big spike in spending on the left in the blue was due to the war, but um, spending. Uh, if implemented, uh, would go up to a post-war high. And uh, um, the uh, anticipated revenue uh, would also go up to a post-war high here. Uh, you can see the, the, the dot here uh, for the Biden administration. And uh, so um, that would be uh, the, the, the difference though, uh, the gap between spending and revenue would also be with the exception of the war at a, at a uh, post-war high, so which would mean more debt. So this is something that uh, uh, our, we are benefiting now, but future generations are gonna have to pay for that and sort that out. And with respect to all the uh, uh, activity, uh, fiscal activity, which uh, results in a change in debt and a change in the debt to GDP, um, this is a compendium uh, from data, Deutsche Bank data on the increase in, in debt, uh, basically the COVID increase from um, the be beginning of 2020 um, uh, uh, through the end of March, the inter that, that intervention, it doesn't include everything, but you can see 
Canada's debt, uh, household, corporation, corporate debt, and government debt has increased 80 percent. Um, just uh, as in their with respect to their COVID response, Japan has had a big response, and we're third. Um, but uh, our debt, in terms of household, uh, corporate debt, and government debt, has been massive. Uh, and does this does not count what happened this fall or will happen uh, here this month? On the personal rate side, uh, here's what I talked about earlier. Um, we can see. Uh, before the Trump administration, what rates were in 2020, what they were after the tax law changed during the Trump administration. Um, and then uh, we can see what they uh, would be if the Biden agenda would be enacted. And you can see the, the top rate is increased from 37 to 39.6 and hits at $400,000 of income, whereas the top rate before hit at $600,000 of income. Otherwise, below 400,000, everything looks fairly similar. Um, and so most uh, taxpayers won't be affected by this. And then uh, in terms of capital gain and dividend rates, uh, same kind of story. Um, uh, once you're past a million, you're rate on capital gains and dividends go, doubles from 20 to 40%. So that'll be an interesting environment to do tax planning um, uh, in. But again, most people, the vast majority of the population will not see a change in their tax rates. So some observations to make here. Um, right now, there's almost no fiscal restraint whatsoever in Washington. Um, you don't read about it. You don't hear about it. Uh, it's pretty much, um, you know, uh, not a matter of spend, do we spend or do we not, it's how much. And so um, the traditional uh, fiscal probity of the Republicans vanished in the last administration and the fiscal hawks in the Democratic Party have gone silent. And so what that means for the future, we don't know. Um, there's no concern for generational equity in terms of what's being uh, spent or, the, or in terms of monetary policy. Uh, what effect does this have on future generations who aren't here to vote? Um, and, and so uh, um, the, what will happen is the political environment involves in that regard is, 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 is uncertain. You don't get something for nothing, which means we're spending a lot of money, incurring a lot of debt. and and the banks, uh, central banks have intervened mightily in, on the scale of, uh, and I'll show this during the um, COVID part of the uh, COVID video, the magnitude of the response, but we really don't know what the consequences are for this, but the monetary interventions are on the order of uh, what we did in World War II. Um, and so uh, we know we'll have higher debt levels and that'll almost uh, certainly impact future standards of living, which will impact, probably impact in U.S. investment returns. Um, an accelerated fiscal agenda, uh, especially with infrastructure, will be good for the economy in, in the coming years. It will increase economic activity. If the infrastructure money is spent um, well uh, for in, uh, investment reasons rather than political, then uh, that will uh, increase future economic growth, um, which is a good thing. Um, however, uh, throwing everything in right now uh, in, the, in the fiscal bill, um, if they do that uh, in terms of green jobs and infrastructure means that, you know, a lot of this won't be available for the next downturn. If we need stimulus, um, you know, we we'll have a high level of debt, We'll have already spent money on these things and, and what will help us cushion the next downturn. Uh, so you know, one might say it might be better to have, leave some arrows in the quiver uh, for what comes later, uh, but certainly in the short run, um, the benefits will be uh, uh, manifest. So we'll, we'll be greeted with massive fiscal expansion uh, continuing into this year. A, a, a synchronized global recovery coming out of uh, COVID and then uh, incredibly um, stimulative monetary policy from all the major central banks in the world uh, probably have not had this confluence of positive stimulus and liquidity events 
certainly in my career. The other good thing that's happening is we're assuming President Biden will not tweet and the reduction of, of abrupt uh, uh, policy changes uh, um, and drama, policy drama uh, will hopefully go by the wayside and reduced drama and, vol uh, uh, and vol market volatility that it generates. Uh, volatility is a cost, so that's good for market prices and that'll be positive for the stability of the global economy and, and, and uh, uh, investment market prices, and that's something I'm looking forward to. Along the same lines, there should be um, less uh, confrontational trade policies and hopefully geopolitical um, engagement and uh, predictability uh, stemming from that is also good for markets in the economy. Um, and hopefully we can uh, reach uh, and stabilize some of the trade relationships uh, to the benefit of uh, both parties. That would all be very good for investment markets and for us as well. Um, the, uh, another possible negative though is the, uh, there'll be definitely an increased regulatory burden, which increases an uncertainty and cost for the private sector. I'm not saying the regulations, regulatory regime or regulation are necessarily bad, but they just increase, raise uncertainty and increase costs. Um, uh, and then um, increasing tax rates for individuals uh, will lower after-tax returns uh, and raise uh, costs for U.S. corporations. Um, so, uh, in closing, um, very stimulative in the short run, uh, as that stimulus comes off, you know, three, four, five years from now, that will slow the economy down relative to previous years, and an enactment of tax increases will engage that. But the priority, rightly so, of, of, uh, in my opinion, of the Biden administration is to cushion the economy uh, with the, uh, from the impact of the uh, pandemic, which is now in its third wave here in the U.S. Um, and um, uh, uh, so we'll, we'll see what comes out of uh, Washington here in the next few days in that regard. But thank you very much for your attention. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact your team and I'm uh, available uh, to help anybody with anything at any time. Thank you so much.